You are watching Adorama TV, and I'm your host, Tamara Lackey. In this incredible conversation with Stuart Scott, we discuss his nearly 20 years as a high-profile sports anchor with ESPN, his hardcore fight with cancer, how he approaches creativity and criticism, and listen in as he shares his love for iconic photography and the definitive source of his constant drive. Adorama TV presents The Redefined Show with Tamara Lackey, where she talks with creatives who make it all work, bringing their best creative and business tips to you, along with fresh ideas and equipment favorites. Redefined Show is sponsored by Adorama, the place to go for all your creative equipment needs. Hi, Stuart Scott. Hi, Tamara. Thank you so much for joining me in your suite. Thank you for letting me bribe you to get to do this. <laughs> you are newscaster, reporter, keep going. Uh, broadcaster, reporter, anchor, uh, knucklehead, athlete, <laughs> uh, cancer survivor, father. Okay. Last two of the most important. Yes. Um, let's start with one of the two, cancer survivor. That has been a significant thing in your life, like crazy significant, obviously in your personal life. I'm curious about what effect it's had in your work, being so successful where you are. Interesting effects. Uh, as far as some of the nuts and bolts, my job, ESPN, my company, they've been... ESPN? Like ESPN. How, how do you pronounce that? It's a, ES, it's a tiny, tiny little... It's like a little mom and pop little cover like little baseball games network. and stuff. Yeah, we, yeah. We'll Got cover it. a game or two here or there. Might have a highlight or two. It's, it's run out of this little shack yeah. in uh, Bristol, Connecticut, one building or eleven D bajillion. <laughs> uh, they were really, really good to me, and and they have been. Like, yeah. And I don't mean like in the way that people are supposed to be good. Uh, I've had bosses who call me. Literally, I have a boss who lives uh, near me who called me and would say, hey, do you want me to bring you some food on the way home? This is a boss. Mm -hmm. uh, I had you know, a couple of guys who I wanted to go back to work kind of after my surgeries sooner than they thought I should. And they're like, no, stay home. Just stay home and, and recuperate. But it was important to me after each surgery, after each bout, after each uh, episode where I had to do chemotherapy treatments to work through them and not take a lot of time off from work. Like I didn't want to be at home feeling crappy because if you're going to feel crappy, you can sit at home and feel crappy or you can go to work and get your and share with others and, and share and be crappy with others. And also it, it helps mentally. To me, it helped mm -hmm. to, to go to work, to feel like I'm normal, Yeah, help mentally. When you were even going through this, you were doing some ridiculous physical activity, right? The PX90, am I saying that right? Yeah. P90X. Close. You just like, I just reversed it and completely screwed the brand name. No, no, but there's P90X, but then there's that new one, that PX90. <laughs> that nobody's heard of. <laughs> no one's heard of, but you and yeah. I. <laughs> what is it like when you do that one? Uh, because I've heard, I mean, because you apparently have done like that during the same time as your chemo, right? Yeah, I would always. Why? Uh, to feel strong, to be strong, hmm. uh, to, to feel like I'm not going to let this thing be. Uh, I always, right after chemotherapy, the first thing that I did was go work out. Always. Uh, and even with, when I had chemotherapy, there was a pack that I had. I was in there for about four hours, and then I carried a drip with me, a 48-hour drip, the little pack, and I would basically tape it to my waist and work out. Uh, and that was a drip of? Of one of the chemo treatments. Right. And here's the interesting thing. <laughs> you have that drip while you're doing I strap, put a belt around it, and go. Oh, that particular chemo drug, the name of it is 5-F-U. That's the real name of it. And that was my mindset. F-U. Mm -hmm. F-U cancer. You're not going to, whatever you're trying to do, it's not going to get done. And it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's in my mind, but it helped. Yeah. I'm going to go work out. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm going to work out hard. It wasn't like, you know, the right Stairmaster. I'm going to go, I'm going to go pound it. Yeah. And I may feel like crap the rest of the day. I may sleep the rest of the day, but I'm going to work out because you're not going to get me. And you think that mentality, because you've, you've done this a couple of times now. Yeah. And three. Three, three. Rounds, yeah. And you, you think that, I, is that a big source of why you think? Huge. For me. Yeah. For me. Huge. Like bigger than big, bigger than huge. Mindset. Uh, mindset. All mm -hmm. mindset. There's a whole community of people who, who are getting their butt kicked by cancer. Mm. Uh, and if I can, if I can swing back, I'm swinging back 
to that guy and that guy and this guy and this woman and this girl. I'm swinging back for them. And you've been on the forefront of a lot of cancer research efforts. Is that is that due in part to that feeling of camaraderie and let's yeah. let's all roll in this? Yeah, uh, V Foundation. Yeah. I mean, I've I've been a part of the V Foundation for probably 15, 16 years, and then when I started facing it, it just became more personal. Oh, you were part of it before all this. Yeah, I've been doing this for you know, probably since nineteen ninety seven, ninety eight. I knew Jim Valvano a little bit when I was uh, working as a local reporter in Raleigh. V Foundation, uh, I got involved with Live Strong last year, uh, Stand Up to Cancer. I worked with them for a little bit. And it's all, the weird thing about cancer is it's such a close community. Hmm. And this nasty disease brings people together. Whenever I see someone who, a cancer survivor and or fighting cancer uh, and or has a loved one, Who's right. Cancer. I was going to say it's not just then those. It's yeah. not just those. Like I just want to, you know, I want to hug them. Yeah. Uh, it's weird. Like it's a weird thing that there's there's a kinship because yeah. of something that's nasty. Well, it's almost like all the kids who are getting bullied by the same guy. It's a perfect analogy. Yeah, all kind of rounding up and saying, "What can we do to fight him?" You mind if I tweet that? No, it's Let's yours. That. I mean, I'll give you credit for yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, uh, Speaking tweet. of, we're really good friends on Twitter. Like, best friends. We're best friends on Twitter. According to me. <laughs> and um, I see on Twitter how um, how comfortable you are taking criticism, highlighting it, retweeting it, and then putting your comments that, from my perspective, um, shows that you're rising above it to such a consistent, impressive degree. How much of that is just like... You know, I hear you, and it bugs me a little bit, but I'm going to rise above. And how much is it? I don't even feel this, and I think it's a joke, and let me put it out there. I mean, how do you take that kind of criticism? It's a lot of the last one. It's funny. It's a joke. Uh, the interesting thing, you and I talked about this, oftentimes is someone is really rude. I mean, I just, they yeah, disagree with me. you get really rude. I get, I get really I'm rude. I'm surprised, actually. And I'll tweet them back something, and I'm not going to rise or sink to that level of rudeness. I'm going to try and outthink them and, you know, like somebody says something that's really wrong and they curse at me, I'll just say, you sound angry. Yeah. You need a hug. I love that you need a hug. I love that. <laughs> you need a hug. What I find often, which is kind of funny, I have a lot of people, God bless them, they'll go, hey, Stuart, don't let them bother you. Mm -hmm. They're not bothering me. <laughs> don't let it get you down. It's not getting me down. But not at all. That's what not, I want to ask. Not, like, not at all. You don't know them. You don't know them. So is it, do you, is Ooh. your mindset kind of like, well, it's none of my business? What it's they, not that it's not my business. I don't know them. Yeah. Who, what do I care? Honestly, what do I care? That's, no, I, and, and, I, this and, is, and, I'm and this is one of the this. things that, that and I, I try and teach my daughters this. And that's the other part of it. I'll get to that in a second. I don't know them. They have mm -hmm. no bearing in my life. What do I care if somebody's going to call me a name or tell me that I'm stupid or dumb or a jerk? Or shouldn't be working. Who, who, who are you? Right. I, that doesn't. That's my friends that I love, my family that I love. If they say something about me, it's going to hurt. It's mm. going to bother me. Mm. Bob or Joanne or Bruce or David, who says something about me. Do you think what somebody's how somebody criticizes me is going to bother me? I'm trying to raise a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> so it's more about like where your attention is going. And, and it's, it's, it's where my attention is yeah. going, but it's also, it's what, not that they pay attention because they're my kids and your kids don't pay attention to you, but at some point in time, if they ever see it, and sometimes they do, I want to show them, this is how you respond to negativity. Yeah. You rise above it. And the, the offshoot of wanting to show them is wanting to show anyone who may be influenced by it. Hmm. This is what you do. Yeah. Somebody curses you out. All right, man. Dude, I feel I feel bad for you. ESPN, you've been there 19 years. 19 years. 19 years. Started when I was seven. Sorry. <laughs> <coughs> seven, um, six, six or seven. Yeah, something like that. And um, in that time, you've obviously re-signed several times, and you recently re-signed for a multi-year contract. Yes. I'm curious how it felt the first time you signed Versus this last time, what the difference has been? First time I signed or the first time I re-signed? The first time you signed uh, on the dotted line and this time when you signed again. First time I signed, it was, I was younger, so it's like this. Yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, oh my God, it's a contract. And there's, there's angst and worry and worry and angst. Probably the first couple of three times. 
Yeah. Because then I was starting a family. I had I had young children, and I was more. Oh my god! 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 What was that? Oh my god! 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 This one, I remember telling my agent, get it done. And it took a long time, but I yeah. said, and she said, do you want to know any details? I don't want to know anything. Just when it's done, it's done. Tell me. Two or three reasons. One, there is angst if you think about it. I don't need that angst. I'm, you know, trying to fight a disease. As I mentioned, I got daughter, teenage and a, you know, pre-teenage daughter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, that's stress right there. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I don't need that stress. I have an agent to take care of it. Uh, I'm also calmer about it because I've been there for so long. And I wanted to stay at ESPN. Right. And I think ESPN wanted me to stay. So It's like a home to you, yes? It's home. Yeah. So if I want to stay and they want me to stay, well, then you say, then you got to find the middle ground. Right. You know, you just got to find, all right, where are we going to hear? Where are we going to hear? We both want to do this. Let's figure out how to do it. Is that excitement still there for you? I'm excited every single night I go in here. You're excited right now, aren't you? I'm excited right now. Seriously. And I, as I told you, I was a little nervous. I like being nervous. Oh, you were serious? I thought you were joking. No, I'm serious. Interesting. I like being nervous. I'm yeah. I'm a little nervous every night before I go on air. Yeah. Like in the studio, I'm a little nervous. Yeah. When I'm on the road during the NBA finals, I'm more than a little nervous. Right. I like that. When That's I a did, lot, right? That's a lot nervous. I was a lot nervous <laughs> on the podium after the NBA finals during the trophy presentation, interviewing LeBron and Dwayne Wade and those guys. Not because of there's those guys. I interview those guys all the time. But right. that setting, that scene, NBA finals, I was nervous. But it was good nervous. Yeah. I'm like I'm not worried about it. I'd be worried if I wasn't nervous. I like being nervous when I work. Right. It, it focuses me. It gives you the energy you yeah, need. Yeah, absolutely. What would you say is the best piece of advice that you ever received that you actually felt was useful, <clears throat> made a difference in your life, and would be worth sharing? Hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. Ah, uh, thanks, Trey. Love that. Hard work beats talent and talent doesn't work hard. Mm-hmm. Do you was, work hard? When I work, and, and the reason why I answer that is because I work really hard when I work. When I'm not working, I don't work. You rejuvenate very well. I just don't, I don't, if I'm not working, there's a decent chance that I don't know what's going on in the world of sports. I might watch Sports Center, but I'm not one of these people that every, every day I'm watching sports and I've got a, people all, you know, ask me, hey man, what about that game last night? And I didn't see it. How can you not see it? Because I wasn't working. Well, wouldn't you have to see it? And I always go, what do you do for a living? Whatever they do. Did you do it today? Oh, no. Would you consider yourself in the creative field? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. very much. Um, and you write a ton of content. I write, I write my, I mean, I write what I do. I, I write my show. I write my, I write my scripts. And how long does that take you to write a script for just a normal, what would be a normal coverage that you would say? And how long does it take to write you, write a script for that? How long it takes really depends on the day. You okay. know, sometimes as a writer, like, you know, I can like... Popping, man. I, just, I got it. I've got it. You're in flow. It's going from here to here yeah. and it's easy. And some days it's it's harder, it's slower. Uh, our 11 o'clock sports center, we have a 5 o'clock meeting. I'll start writing about 7, 7.30. Uh, I'll get done maybe 10, 10.30. And as I'm writing, I may be watching a game if I'm at work or keeping up with one game. Maybe if I have a monitor on here and I'm in the newsroom and somebody else has a monitor here. Oh, what just happened? And then, oh, what? Hey, what's going on there? What channel? You know, and you go. Somebody's got a no hitter, uh, and so maybe three hours to anywhere between one to three or four hours. And that's to deliver how show. much? How much live? Sixty minute show. Okay. Or ninety. So you're about so you're about three to one. Yeah. Ish. Or ninety. Okay. On Sunday nights it's ninety. Okay. And some nights during the week they tell you it's going to be an hour. Which the eleven o'clock Sports Center we don't go on at eleven o'clock. Sometimes we're going 11 20. Yeah. And so we're always like, all right, if we're on 11 20, we're off at 12 20, right? No, you're off at 1. Well, that's not fair. Yeah. Because you kind of want to go home at 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> kind of. And, and I'm, I'm curious about that because the writing and the effort, and, and I talked earlier about um, criticism. I think so much of this is boiling down to the concept of confidence, the idea of confidence, because. Um, it's one thing to say some people are born a little bit more comfortable in their shell and not really worried about other people. Um, but I, in my opinion and um, with the people I speak to, I think it's the number one trip up point for most people. Not whether or not you get nerves, but it's the idea of um, genuinely feeling comfortable in your skin 
and being able to say, I don't, I don't care what they say. <laughs> like, no, I'm not, it's not fronting. I don't care what they say. I think part of that in any job is being prepared. You know, when I said I was really, I was nervous about being on the podium. Yep. Just because it's a, it's a big stage. I went, but I knew I was going to kill it. Yep. Because I prepared for it. Right. I mean, I prepared because it's my job. I prepared because I know the backstar. I prepared because I, I, mean, I know LeBron. I know Dwayne Wade. And I prepared because I had prepared for that night. If the Heat win the championship, this is what I'm thinking. This is what I want to know. I was more than adequately prepared. If you're prepared for your job, whatever it is, whatever it is, then you're going to kill it. Okay. So as you know, I'm a photographer and I love all things. And you're really good, by the way. Like you're stupid good photographer. Thank you. Are you confident in that? Stupid good. You're like, I know that's going to be good. I ain't even got to preview it. Man, just what, you know, because a lot of professional photographers, and I always think you're pro. Why do you need more than one? You're probably like, you don't even look at it, man. I'm good. I don't. And then I throw the camera on the ground and I buy one another day. And then you like throw the camera out and you like pimp off the... I do. I do. All the time. Unfortunately, I shoot kids a lot, so it gets very dangerous. <laughs> but I still throw it on the ground regardless of who's nearby. Um, back to you, though. As you know, I'm in photography and I love, I love imagery. I do. And you work around a ton of imagery. Yes. Um, and vi visually, in terms, mostly it's video, but obviously photography and stills is part of it. Are there any images that stand out to you through the length of your career, like iconic images or, or moments that were captured that you felt that, that that source of imagery was so impactful? Are there any things like that for you? Oh, there are a ton of them. How many do you want to know? 26. All, all of them I can think of right 26 now? 26 to 24. One for each letter? Four. Okay, four. One of them, uh, Willie Mays, 1954 World Series. Vic Wirtz hit a shot right over the center field. Willie Mays turns. He's running full speed toward the, toward the fence, and he catches the ball over his head. So there's one picture of him catching it, and then there's another. He, throw, he turns, throws it, and he kind of falls after he throws it. That always stood out to me. Hmm. There's another one with Willie Mays. I'm not a huge baseball guy. I don't know why these first you two love are baseball. Football. I love football. Willie Mays was on the field, 1965, Dodgers are playing the Giants. Uh, the Dodgers pitcher, Juan Marichal, had thrown the ball and hit a couple of uh, Dodger players. So when he's up at the bat, he gets hit by a ball. And he takes his bat and he turns around and he literally hits the Dodgers catcher, John Roseboro, over the head. It just starts a bench clearing brawl, and there's this picture of just Roseboro has just been hit, and the blood's coming down, and everybody's like that. Uh, Ali, there's so mm. many iconic pictures mm. of, of Muhammad Ali. There's the one where he got knocked down by Joe Frazier in 1971. He's on his butt. I love the picture of Tiger Woods after he won his first Masters, hugging his father. Mm. He's like skinny Tiger, you know, yeah. he just got his arms around his dad, and he's crying. There are tons. There are, There's, it's these moments, though. These moments these, that are pretty dramatic and a lot of yep. emotion. There's one, one of my favorite, when Mike Tyson lost for the first time to Buster Douglas in Tokyo. I mean, Tyson was the scariest man on earth. And Buster yes. Douglas was a bum. And nobody thought this guy had a chance. And Buster knocked Tyson out. And there's a picture. And Tyson's on the canvas, and he's reaching for his mouthpiece. And he's putting his mouthpiece in his mouth, but it's all crooked, like half of it's in and half of it's out. And the referee is like over him like that, like he's counting him out. So you love photography and used to shoot quite a lot yourself, yes? I, I did. My dad taught me how to take pictures when I was younger. I used to love taking action shots and sports shots. Uh, and one of the cameras that he taught me, he gave me a Pentax K1000. Okay. I still remember that. But he taught me on his old school Canon AE1. Mm -hmm. And this year, my oldest daughter, who's 17, she's in getting into photography. And he gave her... That same Pentex, I mean, that same, same Canon AE1. Nice. And I was like, to me, it was like a moment. I was like, Aww. you know, it was like this thing, and it was like emotional. And I basically said, all right, but that's got to, that's got to like stay here at my house. You can't take it over to your mom's house. She goes, I can take it there. I'm like, but it has it's to thing. do with me and you and my dad. She goes, but it's my camera. I'm like, so you're not seeing the whole emotional, emotional thing. She goes, no, nope, <laughs> not seeing it there. Okay, so one last question, and I think I know the answer, but I'm not going to cheat and look ahead. Okay. Um, 
you obviously uh, have a lot of drive in you, not only to succeed and do as well as you do, and um, you know, obviously the top of your game professionally and the writing you do and the delivery you have, but also the way you fight cancer so actively with your mindset. What do you think has been the main reason you're able to stay so engaged and drive so hard? What, what is the reason that you fight so hard? My girls. My babies. Your babies. My sweet teen and preteen daughters. That's it. That's why. It's, you know, you're a mother. Any, mm -hmm. any and every parent knows. I'm not special in being a parent, but being a parent is the hardest, most exhausting, most mind-numbing most difficult, most beautiful, most rewarding, by leaps and bounds, best thing in the world, mm -hmm. by far, mm -hmm. period, period, period. It's better than anything in the world. And I remember, I remember when I first thought about that, and it has to do with football. And I remember thinking, wow, this is so much better than football. And I remember the first time, okay, don't do this, don't do this. <laughs> Don't do this. First time I watched my oldest daughter score a goal in soccer. And it's my oldest. First year she played. My youngest daughter is on my shoulders. And she scores a goal in soccer. And so I start crying. And I walk up into the woods. And my youngest daughter's like, Daddy, why are you crying? And I remember the thought that I had. The, the serious thought was, this is a hundred times better than scoring a touchdown. And I never thought anything would feel better than scoring a touchdown. Watching her do it. Why, it was... I mean, that was my conscious thought. This blows scoring a touchdown mm -hmm. away. And I've had that feeling hundreds of times, watching both of them play soccer, watching them dance, yeah. watching them sing, watching them act, watching them write, watching them even sometimes when they're lippy, even when they're lippy. Just being a little proud like of it. Like in your mind, it's like, damn, that's good. <laughs> that's, that's good. I wish I could have thought about that. So that's why. That's... Where's my drive come from? Mm. Drive for to beat cancer. I I, I don't want to I don't want to leave. Yeah. I want to walk them down the aisle. Oh. So there's my drive. Drive to to go to work. Drive to work out. Uh, it's for them. They make fun of me working out a lot, and or it annoys them. But when I had my second surgery and I went down to like 160 pounds, I was skin and bones. Huh. My youngest daughter, when I told her about it. She got really upset and she said, she's crying, she said, does this mean you won't be doing P90X anymore? And it scared her that I wouldn't be doing it because as much as she ignores it and rolls her eyes because I, I do it to her that it still was, dad is strong. Yeah. So now I'm scared. If dad, if dad can't do that, then I'm scared. So I had to get back to doing P90X. And how, how was it this last time when you had to say, well, you know, this is what's happening? Like with me, I was as scared as I was the first time. I was mortified the second time because it came back. Because you'd already kicked it. I, I kicked it and then it came back. So once it came back, there was a realization that you might not ever kick it for good. Right. So as bad as it was the first time when you hear cancer associated with your own name, when it comes back, I was more scared. And I could tell they were more scared, probably for the same reason. Yeah. And now, I mean, is it something you guys obviously talk about a lot? Or we I don't imagine. talk about it a lot. You don't talk about it a lot? No. Because you talk publicly about it. Frequently. Yeah. But I think with kids, and maybe it's just kids, yeah. and maybe they're at that age, we talk about it a lot less than we used to. I think it's just kind of, that's the... You don't want to make that the centerpiece. 17 and almost 13. Yeah. It's, it's a very, I was thinking about this recently. It's a very interesting balance because if I show my vulnerability, if I show truth, mm -hmm. then I don't want them to be scared. So if I show strength, which I, which I try and do, then I think that they, being children, they get the idea it's not a big deal. Well, we but, take our cues based on how serious other people tell us something is. Right. So if I'm like, oh my God, cancer, I'm really scared, it might kill me. Well. If I do that, then it may give them a more realistic view, but then it also may scare them, probably would scare them. So I'm probably, I think it's best to err on trying to present a front, a strong front, which isn't necessarily a lie, but it is, it's, it's a positive image. 
and just deal with them like, all right, well, that's cool. That's good. And I, and I see what you're saying because the, the, the disconnect is that you're used to being very real and honest about things. And this one, you have to kind of front a little bit. You got to front a little bit. Yeah. But Just, isn't that what we do with our kids? Yeah. We protect them. Yeah. And however many, we protect them in ways that they feel, in ways that they don't feel, in ways that they recognize, in ways they don't recognize. And the older they get, the less they recognize how you protect them. Right. And yet you do it anyway. It's interesting because earlier in our discussion, you were saying, I don't really care about that. and I don't care. That's not my thing. I don't care. And here you're like, I care so much. I, this is my care. I want to thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. This is good. So you guys want to go ahead and start now? I mean, that was good practice. Let's go ahead and uh, Let's knock it out. Up. Thank you for watching Adorama TV. You can check out more interviews with notable photographers and creative entrepreneurs by visiting Adorama TV. Adorama TV is brought to you by Adorama, your best source for the equipment and knowledge you need. For all the latest photography, video, and computer gear, visit Adorama.com. Place your order by 7 p.m. and it ships the same day. Plus, the next time you're in New York City, be sure to visit our store located on 18th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue. Check out the Adorama Rental Company for professional cameras, lighting, computers, and more. We'll help you make the best selection to match your needs while giving you the knowledge to achieve the best outcome from your rental. Adorama is your complete solution for equipment, printing, training, and more. Adorama, more than a camera store.